we got our next performer, and uh, and it's actually me. So there you go. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Doug Rhodes. I've been uh, here quite a few times. I uh, uh, kind of uh, call my poetry uh, kind of a little bit of Dr. Seuss meets Frank Zappa kind of stuff. Uh, I want to acknowledge a couple other people that are here. It's my mom's 80th birthday. Some of you guys may have known that. She's here. My wife, my sister, my other sister's two kids, Riley and Hadley, are here. One came from Indiana, one came from Denver to be here. And Riley from Indiana fished with me for uh, probably the smart, no, not even probably, the smartest deckhand I ever had that, that lost 1,500 pounds of humpies in the fish hole. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, since it is my mom's birthday, I got a little poem. Just, some of you guys just so you know something about mom and uh, this poem. And one of the things about me is I'm not very creative in my title. This, this title is called Mom. Mom was born in Petersburg, Alaska, February 23rd, 1938. That was 21 years before Alaska became a state. Her family ran a mink and fox farm on Blasky Islands near Snow Pass, and Mom was almost born right there if Grandpa hadn't throttled up the gas. She grew up in West Petersburg on Coopernoff Island so pretty, catching flounder and feeding mink across the narrows from the big city. She and her brothers beach sane for money, but she secretly had a wish that her brothers would like to get bloody because she always had to clean all the fish. Her brother John brought a friend home from college to Seine for the summer, and Mom was glad. And I guess we're pretty happy, too, because Ron Rhodes became our dad. She went on to become a teacher, and as a librarian, she was great. She worked for years at Mount Edgecombe High and is known throughout the state. She's lived in Sitka almost 50 years, and everyone knows her there. And if you ever need a place to stay, call her up. Hell, she won't care. She loves to go out fishing, but every year she wants to catch something bigger. She's even stomped on the shores of the Oregon coast because she's a really good razor clam digger. She probably walks five miles a day in Sitka, whether there's rain or shine, and she has a stress fracture from walking too much. But other than that, she's doing fine. So help me give mom an 80th birthday toast. It's a pretty exclusive club. And you know you got to be an Alaskan when you celebrate this milestone in a pub. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We just got back from uh, spending the last few years, I don't know, the last six or 10, 8, 12 years, We've been spending time down in Baja in the winter, a month or two, out on remote beaches and stuff. And it all started when uh, we flew. We used to fly down to Cabo, and then we'd kind of work our way up. And now we, uh, we come about halfway up. And uh, this, was a, this is a poem called Hubcap Cooking. And this was the first meal we ever cooked on our own in uh, Mexico. We'd been staying at hotels. And then I met a guy who gave me some fish, and what am I going to do with this? And from this then on, we kind of branched out. Again, it's called Hubcap Cooking. I met a guy in Los Barriles. He'd been kayaking for several days and fishing for Dorado, and he gave us a couple of fillets. Now, we didn't have any way to cook them, but I'll tell you what we planned. We'd take them into Los Barriles and get them cooked cooked at the taco stand. So with the anticipation of Dorado tacos, we headed down that way, only to find the place deserted. They were closed on New Year's Day. Well, on up to the grocery store. I was feeling in the zone. Got beer and salsa and tortillas, too. I'll cook this fish on my own. So we headed for our favorite beach, gathered cactus stumps, palm fronds, and sticks, then I got the blaze ignited, and I'm sure we looked like hicks. 
Now, finding a grill to cook fish on was like a haystack and a needle until I beachcombed a perfect frying pan, a hubcap from a Volkswagen Beetle. I filled the hubcap full of fish and wedged it level with a rock, dumped salsa, line, and cerveza into my V-dub hubcap wok. And I stirred it with a clamshell, fried it nice and golden brown, then scooped it into tortillas, and we wolfed those suckers down. <laughs> you know, that Mexican food is really good. In fact, none of it is bad. But Dorado tacos in a V-dub hubcap? That was the best food we ever had. All right, this is, a, uh, this is a poem I wrote last summer, and Daniel's dad is here. This is a poem called Ode to Daniel, who is a deckhand on the Miss Mary on the tender. And I got to just tell you about this kid. He's an awesome, hardworking young man, and... Uh, the only knock I have on him is that he needs to get a little more uh, self-assurance, you know. He'd make something up. Like every time we would unload, he would make sure and, uh, and have some kind of a treat made for us. And it was always awesome, but he'd, he'd, uh, he'd give us a little uh, precursor and say, I burnt it. Or, you know, it's not my best thing, but here it is. Or it tastes like crap, but here it is. And, you know, he did, if you didn't put that, that little caveat in there, you would think you had the best food in the world. So this is called Ode to Daniel. Daniel is the deckhand and more on the mighty tender Miss Mary. John really relies on him. It's a lot of responsibility to carry. But after the work, work in the totes on deck, Daniel baked some little treat to offer to the fishermen as they buy fish throughout the fleet. But he always has to tell us that he screwed up the recipe. He baked some cookies and a cobbler, and they all tasted great to me. He said he tried to bake some chocolate chips, but they melted into some goo. But a damn good taste in chocolate bar came out of that residue. Then he made a little nut bar, and it was very awesome, man, even though he said it was all burnt and kept sticking to the pan. Now, if big-name chefs talk like this, they probably all would just quit. But I'm sure that even Rachel Ray ate brownies that looked like shit. <laughs> the difference is all in their attitude that brought them their culinary fame. You see, when you screw up a recipe, you just give it a fancy name. And describe it with some fancy words, maybe even foreign ones you could use or you could give. You see, when you describe your treat, you use an awesome adjective. Like if you bake, bake a batch of cookies and the edges get burnt just a little, well, now you've made some fire-branded Dulce Vita brittle. Or you undercook some goodies and the centers are just a little bit doughy, well, now call it fiercely infused lava cake filled with creamy pahoe hoey So keep on baking goodies, Daniel. We don't want to see you quit. You know we're going to eat it no matter if it even looks like shit. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this poem is written about, uh, uh, I used to, well, I don't even used to. I still have to have an observer on my boat whenever I fish for halibut. Anybody in here a federal observer? Raise your hand if you're a federal observer. One, okay, yeah, you know, it helps to know your crowd, you know, know your audience. <laughs> so the deal is uh, my boat's over 40 feet long. I have to have an observer on there when I go halibut fishing. Well, it's a luck of a draw. It's random selection. You might get one, you might not. I always seem to get them. And, uh, and I have to give them 72 hours notice when I'm going fishing. I don't even like to give myself 72 hours notice when I'm going fishing. So... An option came up last year where instead of taking an observer, I could have the government install cameras on my boat. And when I go fishing, the cameras just record everything I do. Okay? And if you've ever been uh, long lining and you get to the end of a set and you're pulling all the gear and you get to the end of the set, 
inevitably, it's time to take a leap. You have to take a leap. You wait for it. So this is my poem, and it's called, uh, I had a bunch of names for it for a while, but we settled on government porno. Big Brother started watching me this year, and I'm not sure what they will learn. But they installed a camera on my deck and another one out off my stern. You know, the government is watching me now, and I'm starting to get enraged. The cameras automatically turn on whenever the hydraulics are engaged. So when do the cameras ever turn off? This is where my fascination with them sours. Because apparently, after everything is turned off, they stay on for another two hours. It's all recorded on some fancy hard drive into a series of little video clips. Then someone down in Portland looks at and records everything I did on my halibut trip. Now, I'd like to know what all they've recorded and what kind of information they seek. Because I know that at least twice I thought the cameras were off as I stripped down and took a leap. All I know for sure is the cameras have a fisheye lens, and they see things both near and far. But the people reviewing the tape should remember that objects may appear larger than they are. OK, I just have 30 or 40 more here. No, I don't. Even. This one I wrote, and uh, where's Lauren? Lauren Mackey, raise your hand. There's Lauren right here. Lauren, uh, her dad went, hal went to halibut fishing. He went gill netting with me several years ago, and, and uh, there was uh, two or three of us in this little town of Kaufman Cove that gill netted, and we all took friends out gill netting, and they kind of learned, and then pretty soon they all ended up getting boats, and for a while they pe other people didn't even know their names, they were calling them. The other guy that was with me was uh, Brian. And they would say, well, who was out there? Well, it was Brian and Doug and the disciples. That's what they were calling them, the disciples. But now they've been fishing for like 10 years. They've been fishing for a long time. But he said something last year that cracked me up. He called himself Puff Daddy. That was what he was calling himself. <clears throat> and and there's a reason why he called This poem is called Puff Daddy. And... Uh, here it is. He calls himself Puff Daddy, old Ralph, our gillnetter friend. He says he's going to run for the harbor with the very first puff of wind. He says he's just a little wimpy while, while we're all as hard as a rock. But he was the only guy out fishing while we had a harbor day at the dock. I finally head out and look at the dot on my radar. And who through the storm do I see? Why, it's good old Puff Daddy getting his ass kicked on the Julie Marie. He's out fishing in a hurricane, sticking the opening out to the last. No rolling chocks, no stabies. Christ, he doesn't even have a mast. You know, people used to think I was a real hard ass, but maybe they were just trying to be nice. Because last season, compared to old Puff Daddy, I looked a lot more like Vanilla Ice. All right, and this one, I was up in Kodiak doing a little poetry thing, and a gill, who's a gill netter in here? Anybody a gill netter in here? All right. All right, good job. Here's the deal for uh, gill netters. If you're hanging a net and you're gill netting, you do, all you're doing is picking up meshes, you're tying knots, and it's mindless work for a long time, a lot of knots in there. And your mind can wander. At least my mind wanders. And I start counting knots and little diamonds in a net, you know, in a net has all these little diamonds the fish get stuck in. And they start ripping out, and you get holes in the net. And uh, this is a poem about that. Also, a shout out to my gill netter friends on the ass boy out here. Right on. <laughs> uh, here it is, numbers in my head. My sockeye net is 60 meshes deep and 300 fathoms measured along the court line, cork line. But it's hung in with 660 fathoms of web and held together with 5,760 knots of twine. Told you I had a lot of time. When you look at this beautiful finished product drooping down from the net rack poles, 
the entire number of five and an eighth inch diamonds comes out to 12,474,000 holes. Now, once it makes it into the water, that number soon will change. You'll break a mesh or catch a shark. And I began to notice something strange. You see, a gill net is the only thing I know that gets less holes in it the more use it gets. They just turn into really big holes scattered throughout the net. So if you want to get rid of an old gill net and selling it to one of your goals, just advertise it as a used gill net for sale, and it has hardly any holes. <laughs> Last one. And I'll end it with this one. This one is a poem I wrote uh, about, I don't know, four, five, six, seven, I don't know, ten years ago. And what it was was I'd been looking at this spider. I had this real tenacious spider living outside my pilot house window. And he was hanging on the windshield wiper motor. And, I mean, we'd have gales, and this spider would just hang on, and his net would get blown away, and he'd just go hang a new net and do all this stuff, and it just nothing bothered him. And I just started looking at this net, and he, I said, man, I like you. You're my hero. You're a good spider. And the greatest title I ever came with, up with, because you would think it would be like spider, kindred spirits, huh? I saw a spider spit in his web. Man, it looked like a pain in the ass. Right in front of my pilot house window by the wiper motor up next to the glass. And I began to really think about this bug as he struggled to untangle a moth. And I realized that we got a lot in common. We're both cut from the very same cloth. I started making some comparisons between the spider's web and my gill net and jotted down some of my observations while drifting in between sets. You see, he anchors all the corners of his gear to make it all fish better. I don't know if he has a drift permit card or not, but technically he's a set netter. <laughs> he works his web all summer like us until fall weather shuts him down. His gear is working 24-7, and he never needs to run to town. He hangs his web in nothing flat and puts it anywhere he chooses. His meshes are always hung just right. I don't know what kind of knots he uses. He doesn't worry about closures. Coast Guard regulations cause him no fear. I think his web is monofilament, so Christ, he's even fishing illegal gear. <laughs> he's the fastest picker you'll ever see. When mosquitoes show up in swarms, I tell my deckhand, that's how you do it. He says, yeah, but the dude has eight arms. <laughs> He's always building a new net. Most people would call him loco, but he spins web even better than Osada, Momoy, or Yoroko. Sometimes you see them with their webs set one right after another, but they always give themselves at least a net length. They never seem to cork each other. He works his gear rain or shine, and he does it all with elation. Every gill netter should watch a spider as a source of inspiration. So when I see a spider web on the boat, I just smile and let it be. I'd never mess with a fellow gill netter out of professional courtesy. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>